This is Mind Pump, all right? In the fitness and health and medical space, peptide companies and hormone replacement companies have exploded recently. This is like a big thing. Peptide sciences, I mean, remember, GLP-1, Zyklozempic, those are peptides, but there's many, many, many peptides that do incredible things in the body. And then, of course, we have hormone therapy, which is now much more accepted for longevity and health. Well, anyway, we brought on this episode, Ernest Calling. He is the founder of Transcend. These are the, the leaders in that space. These are the leaders in the legal peptide and hormone space. They really run the show. Hey, there's also these really great companies like Transcend. I don't even know what peptides are, but this company called Transcend. Transcend, they have some of the highest quality stuff. What's your protocol right now if you have one? I'm uh, on like basically the Wolverine stack for, for injuries. In fact, we work with them. That's why we work with them. So in today's episode, we're talking about that whole space, that market, how it started. Uh, and we talk about um, some of the peptides that he likes, that he thinks are the most important uh, or amazing ones. By the way, uh, if you are interested in peptide therapy for yourself, for anything from longevity to brain health to muscle gain or fat loss, better sleep, libido, uh, go to mphormones.com. There's real doctors there. This is real stuff. It's not gray market. It's the legit stuff. You'll work with the pharmacy. Go to mphormones.com. They can also do hormone therapy, so go check them out. Now, this episode is brought to you by a uh, sponsor, LMNT. So, LMNT is an electrolyte powder that you put in your water. There's no sugar, no artificial sweeteners, and it has enough sodium. Most of them don't have enough sodium. Believe it or not, you need sodium more than anything when it comes to electrolyte powders. What do you need it for? Muscle contractions. You need it for energy. You need to feel good, especially if you don't eat a lot of heavily processed foods. Uh, anyway, go check them out. Go through our link, drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump, and you can get a free sample pack with any drink mix purchase. Um, also, we have some sales going on this month. MAPS starter is 50% off. This is a beginner strength training program. And then we have a starter bundle. This includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. All of that is 50% off. If you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code SEPTEMBER50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Ernie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so um, you founded and one, you run one of the largest telemedicine peptide hormone replacement companies in the world. We work with you guys. You guys crush it. Yeah. I want to know a little bit about your history, how you started. Personal, right? Yeah. yeah let's yeah. talk a little bit because so you have you you served in the military and yeah. that's kind of the beginning of this road, right? Yeah, served in the military. Um, you know, just four years infantry, that kind of thing. And then um, you know, there was a lot going on um uh, kind of overseas at the time with a uh, global war on terrorism and everything. So I got into contracting and that led down into intelligence services. So I, you know, I continued to deploy and continued to go down range, as they say. And after about seven deployments over a 12 year period, I was pretty worn down. Body was pretty much uh, toast. And uh, my wife's always been into fitness. You know, she always, you know, wanted to compete and do those things. And she started to do that when we had the time. And uh, I wanted to kind of keep up with her, you know, you wanted to you know, stay for pace and I just couldn't do it. And we're talking months, hiring coaches, you know, diets, you know, working out two hours a day, you know, six days a week, you name it. I did everything I could and I couldn't, I couldn't drop a pound. And I finally went to my coach and I asked him what we should be doing. And he just said, look, you need to get your blood work done. You know, as something at this point is off. And I think when I got my test back, it was like 90 you know, it was, it was, wow. and at that point I was, and how like, old are you? I was 34 then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was so. really well, young. Leading up to this, let's talk a first about what led to this because, um, and that's obviously very low yeah, testosterone. Yeah. When you're serving the way you're serving in the military, yeah. doing these deployments, like what does that lifestyle look like? Cause that is not, it's not a oh, conducive yeah. to healthy hormone level. No, lifestyle. no, no, not at all. I mean, the environment, you know, you have that and you know, you're going to have the stress. So your cortisol levels are always up. Your body's in fight or flight for most of the time. You're doing, you know, tons of um, physical activity. And it's just one of those things where you get worn down over time. Imagine uh, being on a football team and having a game every day, mm. you know, and you just, you're getting banged around every single day. Mm. And there comes a point in time where you just, you start to break and you, you're not recovering as fast. You're not able to do that. But I mean, essentially that's what happened. It, it got down to the, you know, physical and mental stress. It just over a period of time just 
breaks the body. Now, are you are you numb to it when that's happening because you're surrounded with all your your buddies and you're going through it all together? And yeah, it's you're like, just you're, probably trained to just keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I just through, imagine yeah. with, with buddies, you're not like each guy's like, oh man, I'm so beat yeah. up, I'm hurting. Not gonna sing like, complaint. No one yeah. is saying anything. <laughs> no, no like. one says anything, right? <laughs> you know, not at all. For a lot of different reasons, right? We're guys, we're idiots, and all those things. But on the side of it too is the mission's really important. You know, there's people out there that depend on you, and you need to you know step up to that responsibility. And when you do that, that's why it's called service. It's supposed to be selfless. And you just put your body at the sacrifice of that, um, your personal life, all those things. Um, you know, that's why we like to thank our soldiers and when they're doing what they're doing, because it, it is a sacrifice and it does take a toll. Um, so, yeah. Do you remember when that started to happen? Like, you know, when, when you started to notice like, oh, I don't know if my if I can keep up with this because you did seven years. At what point were you like, uh oh? And then did that, did that scare you? Were you were you like, oh my god, I'm gonna, I might be a liability here? Yeah, my second to last deployment, um, I had switched to a different agency, and it was, uh, you know, one where I was just kind of like at a at a, a main base, how they put it, like a a larger one. So I had an opportunity to have kind of a regular routine on things, and uh, you know, I, I was trying to just do the daily job and all this stuff. And uh, one day, I kind of woke up and my back was seized and I was, I was done, you know, I was not able to really get out of bed and that's not where you want to be when you're in the middle of a combat zone. So, you know, it turns out that, uh, I blew my back out and it was totally done. So I couldn't recover from that as well. And, uh, you know, the one more deployment after that, and, uh, it just, it was too risky. You know, I, it was at any point in time, you know, I could, you know, knee could go out, shoulder could go out, back could go out. And it seemed like once something happened, you know, it, it just had a chain effect. There was just something else, another injury, and they just kept prolonging and harder to recover from. So for me, there was definitely having a, a single injury, but um, for a lot of people too, it's just not being able to recover from their last injury before getting another one and seeing that happen over and over. I mean, it's cumulative. Yeah, it's cumulative, mm -hmm. definitely. So this may be really a naive question, but I've heard you say deployment and then I heard you say contract work. What's the difference between the two of those? Um, not really much. Okay. Um, so a deployment is a deployment, right? It's just going down into like a kinetic environment. So we were doing combat operations, whether that was Afghanistan, Iraq, which were my two areas. Um, you know, I went mainly as a contractor, which was not military, but working for the military. So uh, they hire a private yeah. agency. You work for the agency, yep. but the government paid. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, 100, 110%. So uh, there just wasn't enough people in service for what we were doing that had the expertise. So the military had to go to outside expertise to, to bring that in. Wow. So, and are those typically different types of jobs? Yeah. You, okay, so explain that. Yeah, so I mean, it could be anything from, you know, the people that work on the vehicles to the aircraft to, you know, people that are in intelligence services, which was my side of it. Um, a lot of people in computers, it just, it really depends. Most of it is all of the support functions. There's not very many that are on the, um, like we call outside the wire or kinetic where they're actually engaging in, you know, mm. combat types of operations. You'll get uh, a lot of the security contractors, right? But that's not their primary focus. They're not there for that. They're there to move people and equipment around. Um, so but, they're not like yeah. on the like okay we're gonna have you guys attack it's basically like yeah. you're gonna protect these people over here but you're yeah. still seeing oh yeah stuff. yeah I mean you're still they're, they're gonna stuff. shoot at you no yeah. matter what yeah they don't really distinguish between any of that yeah wow and so how long did you were you U S military and then how long were you with the with this private organization yeah so four years of military one term and out um, but there was like another eight nine years after that that I was doing the contract and deploying oh, wow. stuff so, yeah. long time wow. how did yeah. you hurt your back. Uh, cumulative over a period of time. Um, oh, wow. You know, I was involved in uh, one or two IEDs over the, over the years. Ouch. Convoys and things like that. So that certainly didn't help. Um, and then obviously, you know, being an infantryman, even young, you abuse your body pretty good. But uh, at the end of the day, when I was at my second to last deployment, it was literally like just getting out of bed. It was just enough things over time that it just, it was done. Hmm. It just, that was the day it decided to go. Do you have a, a single standout, like scary moment of all your years? Oh yeah. Tell me. Um, yeah. So November 8th, 2004. Oh, I got God, to do remember a, the date. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <I laughs> you know, it's forget. bad when someone's like, no, it's this day. <laughs> this exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah uh, it was my, um, one of my first contracts and I was doing private security and we were running uh, convoy security, which meant we were working with um, an Iraqi company that was moving um, weapons and ammunition for the Iraqi National Guard at the time. And Fallujah was going off. So there was a lot of, um, you know, high kinetic activity, you know, in and around Baghdad and to the west of it in Fallujah. And it just so happened that the 
load that we were taking, the vehicles we were escorting that day had nothing but RPG <laughs> and uh, AK-40, like a lot of explosives and, you know, rounds like that. And, um, you know, we were going through a route, um, you know, in central Iraq that was basically they call it the Sunni Triangle. It was a pretty dangerous area to be in. And we didn't necessarily have the same kind of support and, you know, infrastructure that the military has where they have got close air support, medevac, and all those other things. When you're private contracting, the one thing they don't tell you is it's you, you know, and the people you're with, and that's what you got. Um, you know, the panic buttons and bringing the military into the rescue, that stuff wasn't really established when I was doing it. It was mm. pretty early, early days. But um, to not make it too long of a story, it was about 12 hours of, you know, constant contact. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, and it, the, it ended up at the, you know, the later part of the hours of the day that we ended up getting into a, a like a, a fatal funnel. We got hit with an IED. Um, our rear vehicle got destroyed. Um, all the other vehicles had to take off because obviously, you know, they don't react that well to bullets. So uh, the only vehicle that was left was mine at that point because the other vehicles had to go off with the, uh, the trucks that had all the weapons and ammunition. So we had, you know, four or five minutes of basically just us and, you know, just people were trying to yeah. keep, keep alive and, you know, trying to keep the other guys off of us. So it was an interesting day to say oh, the God. least. How do wow. you, how does, how does, you know, and, you know, not to fast forward too far, too far, but you guys, uh, you, you have a foundation, right? For, yeah. okay. And so this is, I mean, one of the motivations is you were, you served and oh, you yeah. went through a lot of this yeah. and we'll get to that because I think, Personally, the the value uh, that you guys provide with the the peptide services, some of the peptides that that are good for things like inflammation of the brain and helping people deal with some trauma, just the yeah. physiological effects of it. I mean, it's just absolutely profound. How does when you go through something like that? How long does it take for you to feel like you, you, you kind of? I mean, do you, does it take a week, two weeks, where you're like, okay, I can kind of get back into my groove again? Well, there's no time to stop, right? So, I mean, as soon as it's it's over and done with, it's over and done with, and then you know, go back get a job to do, you go back to work. It's always the stuff that happens afterwards. You know, it's when you get home and you have time to process, that's when it's really going to hit you. And, um, you know, I think being cognizant of that now and, and just knowing that that was going to happen and, you know, being aware of my situation, um, for me personally, I, was, I could tell when I was starting to have a little bit of issue with it, you know, I'd just be hung up on an event or, you know, have like a loop or a memory that would be continuously, you know, going on. Mm. And when you're doing that, you're kind of obsessing on, you know, something negative. And that's where the mental health issues and the breakdown starts to happen. At least that's where it was for me. <clears throat> so personally, being able to get on like a, the peptides and the hormones and things like that, first things first, when you regulate and you balance out the hormones in your body, the emotions are not so severe. So the lows aren't as low, the highs aren't as high, you know, you're a little bit more uh, in homeostasis. When you're physically able to, you know, get up in the morning and have energy and, and just do your things through the day, it was a lot easier to then to go into like a therapist and do something like EMDR where I could actually go and then deal with my issues because I'm not now dealing with pain and, you know, brain fog and all the other things that came along with it, the fog of war the afterwards. Um, you know, getting that kind of to subside so you can then get treatment it actually made a big difference. Well, yeah, because low testosterone, you don't, I mean, you don't have to have any trauma. Low no. testosterone will cause in men quite reliably anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, and irritability. You know, people think testosterone is linked to a rage or whatever. Yeah. The, the truth is in the studies uh, that I've seen, I mean, we're not talking about these super physiological, like, you know, pro bodybuilder doses, but these are men within ranges. When they're low, they're more prone to outbursts of anger than yep. they are when they're mm -hmm. high. So it's you're far more irritable and just angry and anxious and depressed. No trauma. So you throw trauma on top of that, yep. and it's just the absolute. So what you're saying is, I mean, for people listening, it's pretty profound. So you fix the physiological yeah. hormone profile. Now it makes things easier to deal with. Yeah, and that's how I tie it into the foundation, right? So, you know, just from a personal experience, you know, wanting to be able to share that with other veterans, uh, that was kind of the whole, you know, thinking behind starting the foundation was to be able to use our medications and protocols and do the same thing that I did personally for others that were in need. So when you went on, you were, when you went on testosterone, you started with that, how did you do that? Did you go to general practitioner or did you go to a... I tried to go to a general practitioner and I tried to get the blood work and all those things done. And, uh, you know, they were like, oh, you're too young. You're 34. You don't need that right now. God. Yeah. What so, year is this right now? What, when we're talking about this? Uh, that would have been um, 2014 for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah 10 yeah. years ago. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. That's it's so wild that they were like that. So you couldn't. Yeah. So what'd you have to do then? So I got referred to an endocrinologist, of course, which meant I had to wait another like three months just to get in to see the person 
to then get a lab, you know, done. And I didn't get all the lab markers that I wanted. I just got, you know, certain specific ones around testosterone to determine that I was low. And when I was low, even that low, um, her concern, because it was a female uh, physician at the point, was that I may have used, um, you know, underground steroids in the past or something like that, and that she didn't want to treat me because she thought I would abuse hurt myself it. or harm or, or oh, abuse wow. it. <laughs> and I had never been on any of that stuff in my entire life. You know, I was always in a situation where you could be tested or something like that. And, it, you know, obviously, you're not going to take a bunch of needles with you when you're going overseas. Oh, my God. How pissed so. are you? You have to be fucking... Is this through the VA? Yeah. Or is yeah. this no, like... no. This was all private care okay. back then. Also, got, how would you... Gotta, abuse, you here's what trippy. How would you abuse what they give you when they give you X amount? Well, it doesn't... Right. It makes no sense. Yeah, but it doesn't yeah. matter, though. I mean, just... To, I mean, what basically what he's saying is that she assumed that for yeah. this low testosterone, this guy she probably just came off the a steroid yeah. cycle. Yeah. Yep. And was abusing, and then I'm just helping him out. With yeah, crazy that's crazy. Function. Yeah, because I mean, I was in really good shape back then. I mean, that's all I did was work out. You know, there mm -hmm. wasn't much else to do. Oh, you know, wow. so I came in and I was real fit. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she made an assumption. So I eventually, you know, went back to my coach at the time I was working with. And I told him, and he's like, oh, you need to go to a clinic, this clinic, you know. And it was a, you know, a company similar to what Transcend is, but at a local level and more brick and mortar than, you know, telemedicine. And it was great. You know, I saw the doctor. He explained everything to me, uh, put me through, you know, all the processes, explained the blood work and the markers and how it all worked, why I was probably um, having some of the mental issues along with the physical issues and why that would, you know, subside when I had all the therapies. And he was right. Um, but then COVID hit. And, you know, that was one of those moments where a lot of businesses that were smaller or niche or boutique you know, they didn't all survive. And he decided to get in stem cells and just didn't want to do the hormone replacement stuff anymore. So uh, he literally shut down the shop. And for me, that was really my only outlet. So out of necessity, you know, we went ahead, me and a, a couple other guys and, you know, founded a different clinic at that time. And then, um, you know, we all split off and went our ways and, you know, Transcend was born from that. So now, how'd you done your own research previous to meeting with that coach in terms of like um, peptides, hormones, like what was available uh, for treatments and all that? Or like, how did you really get interested in it? I had no idea at that point in time. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know. And it was that, just and that to was fix you, big, yeah, right? That's all fix, you think. Yeah. yeah. So, and then I think that was the biggest problem because we, I didn't have the education. I didn't know what to look for. I, I didn't understand why my body was doing what it was doing. And, you know, through the process of, going to find the solution and then getting on the therapy. That's what got me interested. When I actually woke up, you know, after eight or nine days of being on therapy and I, I just woke up and I was like, Oh, I'm not exhausted. I'm actually able to get up and enjoy a cup of coffee and play with my kids. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can understand what's going on around me. It doesn't take me two hours to wake up to get in the office and, and be productive. You know, it was, it was subtle, but very quickly, you know, I realized the quality of life had greatly improved. And then, you know, finding out there's other products that do other things. And that's when I got into peptides and started to understand, you know, their value, what they can do. And for me, it was a no-brainer. Uh, uh, it was a matter of, you know, how do I platform the information? I wanted to focus on education and then a focus around social media and tying it together with telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And then obviously introduce, you know, our, our followers to that. You know, we should talk a little bit more about the symptoms that you had experienced because there's... This is kind of a guy thing, yeah. um, but also uh, you can compound that with if you're doing all, you're checking all the right boxes. This was me, right? Yeah. So I'm a fitness guy. I got the you know one of the top fitness podcasts. I'm working out, eating right, taking supplements, doing the whole thing. I took a hormone test because we were offered a free hormone test from another company. They said we'll give you guys free hormone tests, just whatever. And I went along with Adam, and I got my test back, and my testosterone was in the floor. <laughs> And then it all made sense. But, but what I did during that period of time was I just grinded it out. Yep. I just disciplined and just pushed myself and just showed up and just, um, and then when I went on testosterone, it was like someone turned the lights on. Yep. It was quite profound. So that whole time you were just probably same thing. Yep. Grinding just moving out. forward. Yeah. And probably causing more damage too, right? right? Because you're compensating for, you know, your performance when it's going down. So you're, you're going harder and what you're doing, you're just breaking down, you know, your tendons, ligaments, fiber, you know, uh, muscle fibers, and you're just you're not recovering. So you're just literally breaking yourself. So down. what were the difference? You had more energy. You felt better. What else did you notice? Yeah, did you notice? Sleep. Little, sleep yeah. was great. Yeah. Uh, that was the first thing I noticed was sleep. Quite frankly, it was sleep and then the, the brain fog. And then I think every guy notices, you know, if you've, start getting older and libido starts diving and everything else. And then yeah. all of a sudden you wake up one morning, you're like, Hey, 
Uh, <laughs> I, remember <laughs> I, are. I remember this. You know, I, yeah. I know what this is like. This is great. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah. I think that was a, a light. There's like moment. a four. There's like a, <laughs> a, a four or five month period when you first get on TRT where the libido is super high. Oh, it yeah. starts to come down to normal high. <laughs> yeah. But I remember that first four month period. I was like, uh, I don't know, man. My wife was like, <laughs> like, maybe we should go back to low testosterone. <laughs> a little too high. Yeah. But then yeah. it so starts. This to was regular. really out of necessity for you, then. Very much so. Yeah. Oh wow. Very so much. I mean, did you uh, did you approach it with that attitude? Like, did you go into this with like kind of a chip on your shoulder, or just like you were frustrated with how mm. they kind of treated you, and it was. Yeah. Like, Oh, yeah, definitely. Massive okay. need. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, interesting. And I'm glad it happened that way, to be quite frank, because one of the things that I focused on when we actually you know, started the company was having somebody there to be a you know, concierge, to be hand-holding, to explain all the information that I didn't get and the process that I didn't know. So just from having that experience, I filled in the gaps because I didn't want someone else to go through that. This is, but see, this is so, this is so interesting, Ernie, because you must have done some high-level stuff in the military or, or have some kind of background that didn't make this seem so... Like, like for me, if I'm going to start a business, the last thing I'm going to do is go into a space like it seems so complex. Yeah, telemedicine. And, yeah, yeah. Oh my, yeah. I don't even know the first thing. Starting a supplement company is pretty easy. Yeah, you know, the so, regulations and yep. you got to go through. Yeah. Did you have any previous experience that helped you or were you just like, None. I'm doing it. I'm going to figure it out. So um, <laughs> long story short, high school dropout, all those things. So I uh, went back, you know, got a GD, got the military. And then over time, I ended up getting a master's in, in business. So I, I had a really good understanding of the business concepts, how to run a business, how to start a company, you know, and with the military, having the discipline and planning and understanding organization, managing people, all of that stuff, uh, fostering a good culture, you know, the basics were there. And then the desire and the understanding to bring, you know, this type of product out to, you know, everybody. So there's a better quality of life, you know, it was more about the desire than anything else. So everything that I didn't know, I just filled in over time as quickly as I could. Um, one thing I didn't do was give up my day job. So I literally had two jobs, you know, the company and what I was doing during the day for about a year, you know, when we first started Transcend. So what'd you do? What were you doing? So I was in IT and it was okay. e-commerce and that kind of stuff, which makes sense when you're a, a virtual platform. I was so just going to say. Mm -hmm. took that experience mm -hmm. and, you know, all that stuff started to tie together. So that's when all the military and IT background and everything kind of just. By okay. the way, that the, um, the timing of this is a bit serendipitous, right? Yeah. Because, before COVID, telemedicine was couldn't wouldn't, wouldn't be possible in this way, right? One hundred percent. COVID happened. They changed the laws to allow people to yep. do virtual appointments, which which still remain. We're still able to, yeah, able yeah. to do these. So they uh, they repealed the part of the Ryan Act, which um, allowed controlled medications essentially to be shipped across state lines. And, and there's some other nuances to it. That's at a very high level what had happened. And when we were able to do that, and then come up with a, a HIPAA uh, approved platform where we could talk about uh, medical issues over telemedicine, you know, those two things really opened the door and allowed us to do it this way. You, you glossed over something that I want to go back to. Sure. What, uh, what happens in your life to be the kid who drops out of high school then becomes the guy who goes and gets his master's and starts a big ass <laughs> company? Like, yeah, uh, what? Uh, it's a, it's a stupid story, but uh, <laughs> Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. I blew a uh, toilet in high school. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what? So Wait, I what? got, I, you know, I got in trouble in high school, and then cherry you know, bombs or yeah, what? Is yeah, that? something. Oh that. my god! <laughs> yeah, just just being an idiot teenager, doing <laughs> idiot teenager things, and yeah. Uh, and is that why you actually went in the military? Is because you get you get kicked out of high school, and then so you? I got I got kicked out of high school. I actually went back, and um, I went back and became an athlete. I was a wrestler, and I ended up becoming like you know, captain the team and all that other stuff and end up being a junior Olympic wrestler and this all, all makes sense. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, you know, it was, it, I've had an interesting life to say the least, but yeah. Wow. That's wild. Okay. So you get into the space or you start to get in the space. Any surprises? Was, what were some of the first things you saw that you were like, Oh, this is not what I thought. Uh, the fact that there are so many different laws from state to state, you know, I kind of thought when it came to control medications, it would be one of those things where, it'd be pretty fair across the board and it's not, not at all. Um, so the licensing and to understand that malpractice rules, indemnification, you know, just a haul it all is state to state. That was probably the most difficult piece was really understand how to do this. So it'd be done above board. There wasn't any gray area or issue. Um, 
because you're going to have a hard time, you know, getting patients or physician to work with you if you don't really know the rules of the game. So, so do you have to go from state to state to, to state? state? And understand every single state. And then get approved in each state type of deal? How does that work? So the pharmacies have the dispensary licenses. So they're okay. the ones that have to have that part as Got far it. as the medications go. But from the clinical side of it, the physician has to have a license in each one of those states. And then, you know, each state has a different requirement uh, as far as blood work or what qualifies a doctor patient relationship. And that's really the key and critical piece to it is being able to legally establish that. Um, physician relationship with the patient and making sure that that's above uh, board. Mm. And then the rest of it, you know, that's, you know, just uh, potentially with the um, the state regulations as far as what medications can be shipped across the state that, lines. That's got to be almost impossible to find too before telemedicine. Like why would a doctor have 50, 50 states under their belt to be able to do. Yeah. How many? It was, so this <laughs> must've been like a post COVID, like, like doctors jumping on it. Type yeah, of thing. it okay. was. And, and literally we started the company right when COVID hit. So, I mean, it was kind of born at the time where those things were starting to happen, you know, and we, we used a, a medical director that, you know, was a professional medical director. It did have licenses in all 50 States. And it was one of those things where, you know, I had to introduce them to our practitioner and they had to have, you know, prescribing guidelines contracts drawn up that explained that it could work under these licenses for this specific type of, um, you know, clinical work. And it was very um, complex and very layered at first. And then over time, you know, when it became more popular and a lot of physicians were getting licenses in all 50 states for these telemedicine platforms and as laws, you know, relaxed, the complexity was reduced and it was easier to bring it to scale. So it, it took time. Yeah. So when you were looking at it, did you see lots of opportunity as well? Uh, because for, for yeah. personally, so not, I had no interest in starting a company in that space. However, from the outside, when I'm looking at the data, you know, for I don't know how many decades now, five decades, lo testosterone levels dropping in men across the, the Western mm -hmm. world on a pretty consistent basis, like, you know, like, okay, hormone therapy is going to be, this yeah. is going to be a, a, a thing that everybody, I mean, yeah. majority of men, are, unless we figure out what the hell's going on. A lot of people are going to need treatment. Yeah. yeah, this is going to be a thing that- It's uh, not going away. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be around for a while. And then the the changing attitudes around testosterone and the data coming out, you know, because it used to be, you know, just not that long ago, yeah. testosterone is a performance enhancing drug, right? And, Very much. Yeah. yeah. And obviously we got our, our start kind of in the bodybuilding industry because, you know, we went through and talked to the athletes. We knew- that uh, those who were interested in fitness were also going to be interested in their health. And, you know, the stigma behind a lot of the medications being hormones uh, was one of the things we wanted to clear up, right? Uh, we felt that we could prevent injuries and death, you know, in the bodybuilding industry if people would use the medications in the right way and understand how they should be used. There were too many coaches that were out there that were just pumping athletes full of medications for no rhyme or reason. And, you know, they could have been on stage a lot longer and had a lot better aesthetic look and had a better career had they done less of those medications or used peptides and lose some of those hormones. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things that we wanted to target. And that's really what we did first. And, you know, I think that got the, the name of the company out of the, out of the basement and kind of onto the limelight. But as we started doing that, it started getting talked more by influencers. And that was like a whole different piece of it too, was, now you've got social media where people don't have to be an athlete in order to be famous. And you don't have to necessarily have a lot of knowledge to mm. be famous, you know, if for whatever reason it is what it is. So um, that was another opportunity that I saw and I wanted to utilize and then kind of take those platforms and move it towards education and, and getting things to have the right conversations for the right reasons. And that, that really changed the industry, I think. When did you become privy to peptides? Because we're talking testosterone yeah. right now, right? When, when yeah. did you start to learn about the first time I heard about peptides was eight years ago. And I had uh, one of our, we had uh, um, Ben Pikulski on the show. And he goes, hey, what do you think of peptides? I had no idea. So I don't know. I don't know. I've never heard of them. And that was the first time I'd heard of them. And then I didn't hear much after that. Not until maybe like three or four years ago where you started to really start to hear. Like, yeah. Yeah. So when I first went on hormone replacement therapy, the, um, the doctor that I was with, he had been utilizing peptides. And he kind of gave me some bas basic information about it. But um I didn't get on at that point in time. Um, they were very, very, very expensive. You know, even, you know, 10 years ago, the price points were, were far different than they are today. Mm -hmm. um, as those medications became popular, the prices have gone down. So for me personally, at that point, I kind of had to wait till a time where I could afford to <laughs> actually use them. 
but uh, I was very interested in a lot of what um, you know he had told me. Uh, for me, it was the GHPRs, the growth hormone producing peptides, the ones that help your body naturally make it, and release it, and reset your circadian rhythm. The way that they work with the hormones in tandem and just the results you get, it's absolutely amazing. It's it's literally life changing. So, you know, the intrigue was there, you know, the knowledge was there. Uh, it was a matter of, you know, financial means at that point. But as soon as I had those um, and I did go on the medications, you know, I was hooked. You know, at that point, I, I couldn't get enough information on them. And, you know, I was dead set that we were going to start the company. So it was. Now, which ones have been personally the most impactful for you? Because I, I know you've yeah. you've tried Dihex. I imagine Dihexa would yep. be something big for you. What else? What are the ones that have really improved you? Oh, wow. Um, Tesmorlin is probably one of my favorite ones um, all around, just for general health and wellness. That's uh, a growth hormone releasing? Yep, that yep. is. And it, it does so much more than that, too. Um, it's great with weight loss. Um, it's good for your skin. It's going to help you know your natural growth hormone to be released reset your circadian rhythm uh it's a really good medication um so that that's one of my favorites bpc 157 obviously for for healing the wolverine yeah. peptide my absolute diehard favorite will never give it up is dihexa um it just if if you're somebody that has a high profile position and you have to be on all the time um this isn't medication for you. You've had, yeah, I remember, this. yeah, I just remember connecting with you on that. Like yeah. when we first met because, um, it was like what I was seeking for so long because of just constantly hitting my head against other people's helmets. And, yep. Um, uh, I mean, I just remember being in class and being super brain fogged and just not able to really have like clear focused thought and, yep. uh, was always frustrating. And, and even the start of this podcast was really difficult for me to, uh, communicate. And so, you know, I've been trying a lot of different options. CBD has been one of those. It's sort of had a little bit of impact, but Dihexa, uh, yeah. has been tremendous. So. I, I imagine yeah, really there's is. something there because it, all the, you know, uh, IUDs and stuff like that you were around. I'm sure that would cause concussions. Oh, yeah. I remember IUD. when we talked to Dr. Parsley, yeah. he was like, the, that's like take, getting hit in football oh, and yeah. you getting hit in football. So there's probably a reason why though you both feel that as like one of the most impactful ones. For yeah. A hundred percent too. And the other side of that is the, uh, those types of concussions and impacts will also um, damage your pituitary gland, which will also throw your hormones off. You know, you, you won't be producing the testosterone. So, it's kind of a vicious cycle. So you want to make sure that you, you're you getting your base hormones right, but then peptides for when you have the cognitive functionality type of, you know, issue where you want better clarity, um, you know, that's when a peptide comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, you get your baseline and then that's the optimization part. What mm -hmm. I find interesting about a lot of these, like for example, the ones that raise growth hormone, though, you, you know, people say, oh, it's like taking growth hormone, you know, you're doing, no. Y you'll take it, it'll get your body's growth hormone levels up to, where you might have been, let's say you're 18 or 19. Yeah. Not, you're not going to be, it's not like a bodybuilder taking 10 IUs of growth hormone. Right, not at all. So it's very different. So they, because yeah. your body has its own governing, yes. you know, kind of limits on how it responds to peptides because these, these peptides are mimicking signals your your body already reads. Right. You, yeah, you hit it nail on the head. It's a signaler, right? So your body's going to receive that signal and it's going to make what the body needs. If the body isn't creating the signals it used to, um, then obviously your levels are going to drop. That's and it. that's over time what we experience. And we just, it's so subtle over the years, you don't even realize it. But then when you go on a peptide and you reignite those those signalers and you start recreating some of those uh, chemicals in the body like uh, growth hormone, it doesn't take very long for you to be like, oh wow, this is how I used to feel when I was twenty. Well, this, this is why this, this right. has to be why there's no mm -hmm. side effects, right? Why there's yeah. not whether not why we're not seeing any side effects with peptides and why it's not like a SARM or a synthetic hormone or something like that. Is or, because or, of like right. a, or like a or like a drug, right? Because right. a drug is designed to like force your body to do something, whereas peptides already exist in your body. Yeah. So right. they, they recognize them, already has safeguards. So no production. My body's right. not going to make four times the growth hormone it did when I was 18. It also, right. whenever I hear these, and it just confirms what I was saying about uh, these two, is that it, like, it seems that if you're deficient in an area is where you really notice the impact on it, right? right. Where I, like, I, I like Dihexa, like I notice a little bit, but I don't have the same impact that I hear like from someone like you guys, which makes right. sense because you guys probably, that's an area where your body <laughs> yeah. is super had her, deficient. Had her bell run pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So well, well, a another, lot of repair. Yeah. Yeah. C was that for me. So yeah. I must have had, so MOTC helps the body utilize glycogen and the mitochondria work better. Yep. I took Energy. it and it was profound. Yeah. I know other people take it, like, yeah, I kind of notice it. So it's almost like if your body stops making it or needs it, you'll notice these massive changes. MOTC did that for me. Have you taken SS31? No. 
All right, we well, gotta we gotta get you on that one. Too. Right. Oh God, yeah, don't good. start, don't yeah. start. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen your purse? It's already <laughs> massive. You came in with two purses today. Yeah, I was hey, just like, there's always room. We now have two two purses because the other one is not big enough. Is it similar to Monty? Is it? Is it? Is it? It's similar. They work in different fashions. As far as the scientific breakdown of the medication, I'm going to avoid going to that. You know, yeah. I'd save that for more of a, somebody in the pharmaceutical background. But the way that uh, it provides energy in the body, it's, it. it's one of those medications that is, you know, really, really, um, you know, the bioavailability there is high. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So your Transcend now is the, is the biggest in the space. So yeah. I won't go into details, but it's big. You yeah. guys are crushing it. At what point did you know, oh, this is, this is going to, this is taking off? Because you're obviously working yeah. on it. You're dealing with all the regulations. You're dealing with all the red tape, probably making no money. Yeah. And then there's probably a point where you were like, oh, okay, we got something. Who's your biggest yeah. like influencer you got to start working with you? So I have to give credit to uh, two of them. So Steve Weatherford and Jason Post, and they're mm -hmm. the first ones the, to give us an opportunity. And, you know, we started the company right at the end of 2020. And in 2021, April, there was a, a FitCon uh, organ, um, event that was happening in, in Dallas at the time. And we decided to go down, uh, one of my partners and I, and we got introduced to, to Jason and to, to Steve. And we had conversations with them a little bit prior to that. But uh, by the time we left, you know, we had all hit it off pretty well. And we were able to sign them on as affiliates. And then within about a month, it was real clear that, this was definitely the way to drive the information, mm. definitely a way to get, you know, our company brand out there and to get the education. And, um, you know, I think it was like 90 days later, I quit my day job. So that's wow. the turning okay. point. Yeah. You definitely. got those guys on and then boom. Yeah. Was it running at that point? Did you start turning a profit? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I will, we were very fortunate. We were profitable on day one. You know, the way that we had set up the company, we were profitable. But, you know, we started it in the basement with no overhead, you know, and it was, you know, mm. a few of us. And then, you know, we were very um, careful in how we self-funded everything and, and brought everything. We didn't want to have any sort of outside influence on the company where, you know, bottom lines became the, the highest priority. If you're in a service industry, then you need to focus on that and, and hone your skills and make sure you're doing it in the right way. So for us, as we were getting ready to scale and we were coming up, it was also about making sure that we were doing everything to the best of our ability. And once we felt we had that, then, you know, we brought on the influencers and really started pushing. Now, this has happened so fast for you. So, and I, and I love to talk to somebody that scaled a company to the size that you have. Were there like clear things that happened at like each marker? Like I always tell people that there's, there's, there's a huge difference between scaling something into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, then into the millions of dollars, and then the tens of millions of dollars. Like each level presents like different obstacles and challenges. Can you recall like what those were at those different miles? Like, you know, yeah. obviously day one is getting into the thousands of dollars and then moving yeah. on, like what, what the, each obstacle has presented for you. So the biggest transition <clears throat> was going in from that hundreds of thousands to uh, millions in a month. And that was just the actual scale of the operation, having enough people that were trained and could respond to this the volume of calls and the volume of patients and then keeping that quality. Um, and there is no doubt there was probably a period of three months that after our first fit con and we had influencers coming on, I couldn't hire people on fast enough. So it was a big lesson to learn that if we were going to bring people on and we knew we were going to scale, it was we hired first, trained first, made sure that we communicated with the pharmacies, made sure that they had the inventory and the expertise. And then we would go ahead and find out and bring the affiliates on and then scale the company up to our capability where before we had... <laughs> went the other way and it was a lot harder. So. Yeah. so talk about these compound pharmacies because th what's interesting about this is that these peptides go by their generic names. Mm -hmm. So they're not, uh, a, g a good example would be semiglutide yeah. or peptide, yep. brand name Ozempic. Yep. But it's the same, yeah. same exact compound. Semiglutide, Ozempic, Ozempic's 10 times more expensive. Semiglutide yep. is just about basic. So how do, how do these compound pharmacies work? Are they... FDA regulated? Like what's the deal yeah. with that? So they're FDA inspected, inspected. and they're using FDA approved um, sources for API or the raw material for the medications they compound. So the FDA comes into 503As and 503Bs and it's depending on the amount of volume, essentially they're pushing on batch size of those medications, which is the designator. Um, but the pharmacies work the same way as any other pharmacy works, right? It's a physician uh, driven prescription, but with the compounding pharmacies, obviously they're doing everything through mail, you know, through shipping and they're, they're dispensing to multiple different uh, states 
where you know, a regular pharmacy is just going to be, you know, local B to C local, yeah. or the other way is you have the the massive big pharma companies that are manufacturing on the mass scale, and then obviously supplying the smaller pharmacies that go to the the patients. With us, the whole model is different. You come to us, talk to us first. We get a, a design around what you need, and then we tell the pharmacy what to make for you. So it's a completely different process, and it also gives the patient the ability to have control over what's going on in their own body and what's a priority to them. Mm. You know, that's one of the biggest things we hear when we have a new patient come in is, you know, my physician wasn't listening to me or I didn't know my options. And, you know, when they're done and they, they've gone through our process, you know, their priorities were heard first. And, you know, we were able to fulfill whatever it is they needed by having access to those. What's, what's interesting, too, is about with your space is as I've watched it, it, it started catering largely to bodybuilders, fitness fanatics. Then it went to, and then maybe kind of along the side, biohackers. biohackers yeah, definitely and those kind of, of it. Now it's really moving into like longevity, health, yeah. preventative medicine, uh, which I feel like, you know, a lot of fitness and health moves through those channels. Yeah. Because now you're hearing people who are not fitness fanatics, they're not bodybuilders, they're not biohackers, but it's like, I want to feel better. I want to play with yeah. my grandkids. I want to play yeah. with my kids. I have uh, autoimmune disorder that causes inflammation this peptide helps with the inflammation or yes. i have the skin disorder so now it's looking like it's starting to go kind of mainstream in that direction yeah mainstream into preventive medicine i mean i always kind of coined the term that it's just a better quality of life so i mean you're definitely going to have you know anything that you had symptomatic wise for the most part you know you can you can improve your situation i can't say that it cures or it does anything that um, you know, it was a miracle. It's, it's not that, but it's definitely going to improve your quality of life from whatever symptoms you're having. And I think that's enough for most people that when they have that access and they're able to control that and their own priorities, that it becomes very appealing to them. So the more people that find out about it, obviously, the, the more it moves in that direction. And I think there's a bigger role for it to play, you know, in the future. Um, you know, I've always looked at it when you talk about large corporations and wellness programs and, you know, how this will fit into the mainstream healthcare, uh, you know, long term. I, I think as a supplemental kind of a, a piece to these healthcare plans, it's, it's always going to be something that, you know, will have a spot in a space. You know, you can have healthier um, employees, healthier patients, you know, less claims, you know. And that'll bring down, obviously, costs for companies and healthcare companies, but yet they're still collecting their premiums. So, you know, they're, everyone's essentially benefiting it from it, and there really isn't a downside if it's done right. In other words, insurance companies will yeah. get their premiums, but they'll have less claims. So yeah. the insurance companies are saving money. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sure that'll, money. And that'll um, you know, provide opportunity for discount for those companies that are working with them too. So, you know, there's a way for even if they're, you know, paying less and the, even if the, you know, premiums were to slightly drop, if you, you know, drop those claims by even three or 4%, that's billions of dollars in the yeah. industry. So, I mean, there's plenty of room to play with that. Speaking of cost, have just in your time of being in the space, how much have you seen for the end consumer that change? What was it like when you first got into it? Like, I mean, you mentioned you couldn't even afford right. the peptides. Like, what was it like, like some of these things? And then where is it at now in comparison? Yeah. So like, where do you see it? Well, Five, 10 years ago, it was super expensive. I mean, you couldn't have even gotten um, a month's supply of medications for like less than $3,000 hmm. out wow. of pocket. You know, um, now you can especially, you could spend $3,000 and have six months worth of medication and that could be multiple medications. So, I mean, it's probably about a third to two thirds less depending on what peptide, because obviously they, you know, medications kind of go through different evolutions. Sometimes, you know, they get mixed with other medications or one will get restricted by the FDA or something new comes out. Um, anything that comes out as new is always gonna be more expensive. Yeah. Um, but the tried and true meds probably are, are base 10 or 15. They've come down, you know, anywhere between one to two thirds. Yeah, where I, I'm trying to think, like, I think one of the best that's out there is BPC-157. So, oh, definitely. Uh, it's probably- I call that the creatine of peptides. Yeah. Right. It's probably one of the most researched. It has so many different applications. Uh, er, anybody and everybody I know that's used it swears by it. Yeah. Uh, where was that at price-wise, you say five plus years ago, and where is that at today? Um, you know, you it's, it's probably a med that's in the, that 200, 200, 200, uh, $300 range. Uh, I would say it's probably about half the cost of what it used to be. Oh yeah. yeah. That's great. And it'll continue to drop as the, as the market continues to grow. It, it should. Yeah. I mean, it, it, when you scale up any kind of product like that, the cost of manufacturing comes down. And when that cost of manufacturing comes down, at least in our space, you know, 
you're going to pass a certain amount of that on to the customer. Does, does every peptide have like a, a name brand version of it? Like we talked about Ozempic and semaglutide yeah. as the basically not the all of them. Um, Cause a lot of them, not all, they weren't always brought to market. Right. So a lot of them had research or were used mm-hmm. um, for different reasons. You know, we might be using it not even for whatever it was originally created for. Um, you know, Dihex is a really good, you know, example where it was, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, what it was originally intended for, but it, you know, cognitive functionality and just overall brain health, you know, we saw the benefits for it. So we're, we're still utilizing that, but it wasn't brought to main market uh, ever. By so that's the reason why that yeah. is because yeah. Ozempic has been brought or semi yeah. has been brought to the main market, yeah. branded as Ozempic. Yeah. I, don't you find it? I feel, I think yeah. this is so- Good old medication patents. I think it's so fascinating mm-hmm. to me that, and I'm just as guilty of this, going to Rite Aid for NyQuil, and I buy the fucking NyQuil brand when the yeah. safe, the CVS, the CVS brand yeah. formula. with the exact yeah, formula, the formula is $3 yeah. cheaper right next to it. Like yeah. we, we were well, so trained. Well, we're so trained that people don't know that Advil's ibuprofen or, yeah. you know, that Tylenol. I know. And I, I know better. I, still, yeah, yeah, like yeah, I, I, I catch myself yeah. doing that and uh, I go back. I'm like, what am yeah. I doing? Like, you know, is there any other crossover? Because I know Ozempic's probably like the best example of like, if, if you have like a general practitioner, yeah. like they would probably have heard of that. Right? Yeah. Versus like, I still find people when they go into their general practitioner asking questions about peptides and they're just oblivious. Oh yeah. Cause it's not something that they're going to learn about in a, a normal med school. I mean, they, they really are, they're not going to go over these kind of medications. Not yet. Is there any not movement yet. in that direction? Anybody oh, voicing it? Yeah. Like, so longevity or reten- uh, regenerative medicine, it's really an emerging mm-hmm. market. And I think as it becomes more popular, you're going to start seeing people specialize in it. I could see it becoming a fellowship and then eventually probably touched on in med school. E- Eastern Europe was far ahead of us with yeah. this for a while because the, the Russians studied a lot of these for their athletes and for their soldiers. And, you know, so a lot of these were discovered in the 70s. Yeah, yeah very much. I mean, we're, we're 50 years behind them. Mm-hmm. So, on, on all this stuff. So when the news, uh, when Ozempic came out, hit mainstream news, what did that do to you guys? Because that must have been, that was like some massive awareness very all much. of a sudden around peptides yeah it, it very much was and when people realized that you know we had the product you know they started asking about it but i mean it definitely had a, a massive impact i mean there's companies that are out there now that are just doing the weight loss and they're just doing semi-glutide um for us it, it definitely had a, a positive impact but we become like i said more focused on preventative medication that it, it there's so many other things that we're treating and working with that you know, weight loss is probably already a focus and it's already been something that we've mm. been utilizing with other medications like Tesmorland, another medication that one was actually brought to market uh, for AIDS. It was originally a Grifta. Um, so Tesmorland's its generic name. Mm. Oh. But, you know, we just to stop to yeah. help against uh, muscle wasting from M- HIV muscle wasting and then mm. to uh, help attack the visceral fat around the organ. I always thought that's, that's why they they put they prescribed testosterone for AIDS patients was for that reason. Yeah, was for the muscle part of the strength. reason. Yeah, part of yeah, testosterone and uh, other other steroids. But but testosterone was specifically yeah. for visceral body fat, so body fat around the organs. And muscle wasting, and it was sh- it was shown in studies to work really well. That's what it was used for. That was the thing yeah. I noticed about the testosterone was that, and I've I've experienced like actual growth hormone too. But both of those, whenever I am using that, my body fat percentage, I just stay. I'd say I don't know two percent leaner with yeah, like everything eat, being the same. Like everything being the same. Yeah. Diet's yeah. the same. Training like. By the way, that's that, that that's significant, but I want people to understand that it's not a replacement for exercise and diet. No, no, no. no. But two percent with no change is, yeah. is still amazing. That's a, I mean, that's exactly what I've kind of narrowed it down. Yeah, I would to. say I've, the same. And, and it just and, and I've had times where I've fallen off taking it, and I all of a sudden look like I'm caring about an extra percent yeah. or two body yeah. fat just well, from that. I mean, you said it right there. You notice it, right? So yeah. it's obviously enough that you you can feel yes. and see a difference, yeah. and and that's. that's that's where you want to be, right? You don't want it to be anything more than that at that point because that's where people start abusing medications and things get worse. You, you want it to be able to be regulated in your body and and do what it's supposed to do, but not have those adverse side effects. And that comes back to being a signaler and just telling your body, hey, this is what you need. This yeah. is why I love what you're doing with your foundation because when you're dealing with, so your foundation focuses on helping uh, vets, right? Veterans, first responders, law enforcement, okay. firefighters. Here's why I like okay. peptides because other medications, uh, there's, there's, I mean, not always, but there's often a potential for abuse. And when you're dealing with people with PTSD or people who work, these are very stressful. I mean, you picked categories of like stressful jobs. Yeah. And if you give them other medications, you may run the risk of dependencies or other types of issues or side effects that could cause more depression and other stuff. Oh, yeah. 
Meanwhile, peptides, like the, the risk of abuse is like, you can take as much as you want. Your body will only get so much of a signal, you know, and that's that. Yeah. So um, how, tell us about your foundation and then tell us about the, the, I guess the peptides that are most helping these individuals. Yeah. So absolutely. Transcend Foundation. Uh, we founded that about a year after the company was started. Uh, like we said, for firefighters, uh, first responders, law enforcement and veterans. And, you know, just having veterans in the company and myself, you know, we've kind of focused in that area a little bit harder, I think, just, you know, from our own personal networks. Uh, but a lot of things we're seeing, you know, a lot in the mental health space, you know, and that's kind of goes back to my earlier conversation about if you can give somebody hope, make them feel better, and they don't have these physiological issues that they can handle the psychological issues a lot easier and a lot better. Um, I think now being able to explain that to the people that are coming from the foundation as we get them on protocol, they get excited because they understand that that makes sense, right? You know, if you don't have the energy or you can't even focus on with your therapist or the person you're talking to, uh, and your emotions are hard to regulate, how is therapy going to do anything? Right. You know, so we we focus a lot on that. And that comes with the um, just your based hormones with testosterone and those kind of things. Um, as far as other medications, the BBC-157 is obviously for all the injuries that we see, dihexa for all the cognitive issues that we see. Uh, the rest of it is really dependent on the patient, uh, just on, on what they need. I would say the, the three that I was referring to with testosterone, dihexa, and BPC are probably the most significant. But, you know, we'll use like TA1, thymolysin 1 for somebody that's got auto, autoimmune issues or other inflammation in the body. And, um, you know, we'll use a different form of BPC in the capsule form for somebody that has gut issues. You know, there's there's a lot of different options that we have. So, How does someone use your foundation? So, like, you, you have a veteran. How do they go through your foundation? And I'm assuming you guys provide them with care and we medicine. We provide them with care. So, free medication is free care um, for any um, of the veteran firefighters, law enforcement that are in, in need, right? So we have to prioritize because there's a lot of help, uh, a lot of people that need help. So we'll go through and we kind of, you know, the individuals that come to us, we'll assess them to the best of our ability. It's similar to the VA almost where mm -hmm. you, you have to go through like a, a rating process. Um, obviously ours isn't nearly as much red tape. It's a lot quicker and a lot faster, but we have to put a lot of thought and intent when we bring somebody on from the foundation side. Because we bring them on, we're bringing them on a patient for life. You know, if they need uh, testosterone, they're always going to need testosterone. We're always going to need to account for that mm -hmm. cost. We don't want to bring on a patient from the foundation side and then, you know, have a funding issue and not be able to carry right. them on. So, you know, right now, the way we've been doing it is we call it like a mesh network where we've partnered with, you know, four or five other um, charities that focus on other areas, whether they're, you know, financial, spiritual, you know, they're working on the... Mm -hmm. um, you know, mental health area specifically, you know, and then we have, you know, the, the physical side of things. So, you know, we'll just work with them on their patients and then send them ours that we have. Uh, that's kind of how we have to do it at the moment until we can, you know, scale that up. It hasn't caught up to the size of the company yet. So that's awesome. So uh, you guys have seen good results. Definitely. Oh yeah. Uh, we have a ton of testimonies. Um, you know, I don't want to go through everyone else's personal stories, but I feel very comfortable saying that we've, we've helped people, um, stay alive. You know, you told me a statistic awesome. earlier. Um, and, and, and I know that this has been such a problem that the, our own government has really taken notice. In fact, the research around psychedelic therapies for mental health, mm -hmm. it, the, the reason why they were, they kind of allowed the regulations to loosen was specifically because we were losing more soldiers to suicide than that we were to battle. 22 a day. 22 a day. That's the statistic you said. Yeah, 22 That's a day. That's crazy. That is absolutely um, terrible. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah it, it is. I mean, you see them in the most of impactful areas in the military, too. So a lot of the special operators and you know, the tier one guys, those are the, the most affected. They've seen the most combat. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, anybody who's gone over and done enough deployments and had enough, you know, you're, you're going to have issues at some point in time. And and dropping the stigma from getting help and being able to say that you have PTS, you know, PTS is something we refer to now. We kind of drop the D from being a disorder. We want PTS to be looked at more as an injury than, mm. than something that is long-term for That's life. That's permanent, right? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be permanent. You know, it's more of a perception than a reality if you treat it the right way. Ernie, yeah. would you mind if I went into yours a little bit? Because I yeah. know you said you, you, you went on hormones, you did peptides, by the way, the data shows a clear connection between inflammation and things like depression, anxiety. So physiological. Yeah. Okay. So obviously there's, 
emotional stuff that's there. Yep. But when you throw inflammation on top of it, it's just you're just making everything much worse. Oh, yeah. So you went on these things, lowered the inflammation, hormones are up, feel better. Yep. Then you did therapy. Yes. You mentioned one called EMDR. I've done yep. that. How yep. was that for you? For me, it was beautiful. Um, you know, it took a little bit of time for me to start noticing it, but um, you know, within a few sessions, I started to, you know feel less anxious. I, I wasn't focusing on things the same that I used to in, in a great way. I wasn't fixated on mm. an event or an issue, you know, just the, uh, the trauma response, the emotional response to an actual issue or an event, you know, it, it kept getting lower and lower over time, which is what the therapy is supposed to do. Um, I, I did it for a little over a year and a half, you know, I don't know, 10 years back. And then a few years ago, I went back and got a tune up, so to speak, just to, you know, be a, a double kind of a hit on it, but it's been great. I haven't really had any second thought to a lot of things that used to, you know, drive some dark times. Wow. And your dad now. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah Definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 14 year old daughter, eight year old son. Yeah. That's awesome. You actually get to see him now. So it's nice. Uh, <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. That's exciting. So, so, um, do you think the therapy would have been, what, what would it have been like for you without the testosterone and peptides? Or would you, were you just so tired and so that you wouldn't have the energy to even try? I wouldn't have the energy, but the other piece to that too is, you know, self-medication, right? So a lot mm. of the veterans or people that are, you know, in these situations, they're turning alcohol on drugs and mm -hmm. substance abuse. And if you're focused on that and the, and the other issues and you're not focused on your health and, and getting things balanced yeah. out chemically in your body, then, you know, the other part of that, the, the therapy isn't going to do. I have to, you know, I have to add to that. I just study just came out. In fact, I was going to bring this up on our show that exercise done properly was twice as effective. There's a new study twice as effective as antidepressants. Yes. For, um, the, just the, the, the typical type of depression that people will experience, um, and seek treatment for that's profound. That's proper mm -hmm. exercise. Now things that can help you get to exercise or help, uh, the effects of exercise have got to be at the top of the list. So like, right. you know, when you're walking around as a man with 90 total testosterone, yeah. I mean, mine was at 230. Okay. So I was like more than double yours. So still not low. I was still low. Around easy. But I know what my workouts felt like. And I did it just because I'm I'm just a fanatic and disciplined as shit about it. But I know what my workouts felt like. Oh yeah. So, you know, somebody's walking around who's not like a fitness fanatic like I was and 90 testosterone, you ain't gonna, you don't wanna do, you don't wanna go work out. No, no, you wanna go home and go to bed. Yes. You know, and you don't really engage with people the same way. Your energy levels are low. Um, so, I mean, it just oh, a bunch of problems, but being able to get on testosterone was such a quick um, boost of energy and change physiologically that it didn't take but a few weeks before I did want to go back and work out. You and know? then you can and use all those skills of discipline that you learned. Exactly. I mean, that was the thing that I noticed when we, I mean, I went through that through this show, right? So there was a, what, two and a half year period there where oh, yeah. I came off of testosterone and I was on this mission. This was before my knowledge about peptides, and anything like that. And I was trying to, to, to get it up naturally. And it was so weird to be a, considered a fitness guy who I had no drive to go work out. Yeah. yeah. And that was getting on the hormone therapy of everything. Would that mattered the most? Like it was just, just having the drive to want to go to the gym made the biggest mm -hmm. difference. Uh, and I, you think there's a lot of people that don't then realize you get the compound effect, right? Now the workouts yeah. are consistent. Exactly. Those are working. Right. And then it all, and then it snowballs. And I think there's a lot of people that one, I think that because men are terrible yep. about going into the doctor and even getting blood work and checked out. And it wasn't like I wasn't functioning in life. I was still going about my day working, doing everything else like that. Whatever. You know, my problem was with it, yeah. Ernie was that, um, was one of the, the biggest, side effects of low testosterone that'll get a man to finally ask for help is is uh low libido that'll yeah. get a guy to go okay fine i'll go see the doctor my libido was okay like i was still okay um so it's not every man that gets this crushed libido libido right. with low testosterone now i had the low energy i had the anxiety I had all this stuff but that's what made me think that uh, it, it, ha it can't be testosterone. I'm still, well, you know, feeling let me okay ask there. you, how was it after? Oh, I mean, I told you. Yeah. My, my, <laughs> yeah. 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 And even when it settled, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm back to my, you know, my, my younger self. Right. But exactly. But, um, but yeah, for, for men listening, it doesn't have to be like all those symptoms. It could be, you know, three of them. I mean, you could just have anxiety all of a sudden. I, this, yeah. I, I talked to somebody who listens to the show who said, I got my testosterone levels checked because of your show. My symptom was just anxiety out of nowhere. It's like I was never an anxious person. Yep. All of a sudden, I'm anxious before meetings. I'm anxious before, 
you know, I'm in traffic and I'm just getting anxious. I don't know what the hell's going on. Decided to get a hormone panel and my testosterone was on the floor. Well, the one thing people should be doing anyways is before they're even having symptoms or any issues, you should be getting your blood work done anyways. No matter that way you, have, baseline. you have a baseline and you, and you can tell that way if you are symptomatic, you can yep. understand if it's placebo and just a circumstance of life or is there an actual issue? Yeah. You know? I, when I met my, yep. my wife, right? She, I was 29, she was 30. And I remember her mom had, and she's the youngest of four kids, made all the kids before they were even 30 years old, go get their full panels done. So they had a baseline. Yeah. It's and I actually had never heard anybody tell their kids to go do that. And I thought that was really interesting, but it makes total sense. Like, cause you think, Oh yeah, I'm fine. I don't need to go do any of that stuff right now. But yeah. But then when you get a little bit older mm-hmm. and you're trying to figure out what your baseline is like, that's, and that's so yeah. unique to each person. Like, you know, someone that's like Doug, the other yeah. thing is you could have two men can have testosterone levels that are different, but within range, one can have, Symptoms. symptoms. One, yes. yes the, their one. androgen receptor density plays a role. Yep. So your general practitioner doesn't know this. They and it, and it manifests differently. Like you just said, like you noticed, like I didn't have any sort of anxiousness or anxiety or anything like that at all, but I low drive and libido. I mean, yeah. those were the two for me. Libido and, and drive were just crushed. Yeah. And your numbers are, they're not gonna be the same for anyone either. Right. right. So you could have a testosterone level of 600 and still feel like shit. Yeah. Um, or you could have a testosterone level of 450 and feel amazing. It yeah. just, it's so independent. It's yep. so, you know, personally based. How many, how many people are on the foundation do you guys have? Do you know? As far as uh, patients? Yeah. Uh, we have just about a hundred patients right oh, now. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you know, we've given back about 1.5 million in the last 18 months. That's so, amazing. That's, right. that's yeah. awesome. It's, it's is there a really place good. people can go to apply for that or? Right now there isn't. Okay. Uh, and that we've been working strictly through our own foundations and connections. Um, so we could kind of keep quality control and all that on it. I think, um, you know, when I have more, you know, bandwidth ability to bring in some more um, influencers in the veteran space and work strictly for the foundation where we can bring in some donations and donation revenue for the foundation Mm -hmm. and we can grow it a little bit more. We will. Um, But right now we've been really focused on making sure that we're getting the clinical side of it right and understanding it and, you know, making sure that we understand the community's needs and wants uh, and tying all that together. Mm -hmm. And we're pretty close to where we feel comfortable at. um, But, we want to make sure that we have that right first. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Well. Ernie, this has been great, man. Yeah. yeah. I can't say I appreciate you guys enough. Uh, Pleasure yeah. seeing you, dude. Yeah. Awesome. It's Excited really for this year, too. Stand up people. It's one of the reasons why we, we met with you. That's why we work with yeah, you. You guys so. are a great resource. Yeah. We appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So, in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.